the simplest kind of memory we can design is the NOR ROM. And in this video, we will be considering a for real ROM, meaning that the contents of the memory cannot be changed once the memory has been fabricated. So here we can see a very small uh, NOR ROM array. Um, again, arrays consist of columns. Each column is call, called a bit line and rows where each row is called a word line. So you have word lines from zero to two and bit lines from zero to three, giving us a three by four array containing 12 bits. At the intersection of each row and column, there is a cell. So you can see a cell here and you can also see a cell here. So we can see that there are two different kinds of cells. There are cells that contain NMOS transistors and cells that do not contain NMOS transistors. We will demonstrate um, very soon that cells containing NMOS transistors are storing, storing a logic zero. Cells not containing NMOS transistors are storing a logic one. So the first thing we ask ourselves about memories is how they manage to store data, how they distinguish between logic zero and logic one. And the answer is obvious for the NOR ROM, uh, a zero or a one is distinguished by the presence or lack thereof an NMOS transistor in uh, the cell. Now, where there are NMOS transistors, they are going to connect their drains to the bit line and their gates to the word line. And why is this called a, uh, an ORAM? Because if you look at any of the columns, you will find that the column forms a, generally forms a pseudo NMOS NOR gate. So you can see here a pseudo NMOS NOR gate with a single PMOS load transistor on the top. And then there are three NMOS transistors forming a NOR gate uh, in the pull down network, each activated by a different word line. So in a certain column, we don't have to have uh, as many transistors as there are rows, we can have less transistors than, than there are rows. For example, in bit line three, we only have a single transistor. And so this is a special case where the column actually forms a one input uh, NOR gate, which is basically a pseudo NMOS inverter. But in general, this is a, uh, a pseudo NMOS NOR gate on each column, which is why we call this a NOR ROM. So how do we read from a NOR ROM? Generally speaking, in all um, memories, the read process consists of first activating a single word line and then observing the values that appear on the bit lines. So let's just assume that we are activating uh, word line zero, for example, and uh, let's assume that we are looking at bit line zero as well. So uh, we are looking at the contents of cell zero zero. So when we activate word line zero, that means we put a one on word line zero and zeros on all other lines. And the block that performs this operation that puts a one on a single line and zeros on other lines is called a row decoder. We already described that it is uh, an, uh, a k times two power k uh, block, which activates only a single uh, line of the two power k lines indexed by the uh, number contained in the word K. Uh, now, at cell 00, zero there is a, an NMOS transistor. There are also NMOS transistors in cells 10 and 20. But in cells 10 and 20, these NMOS transistors are deactivated by the fact that their word lines are zero. So the only transistor that will be active is the transistor of the word line from which we are reading. So the equivalent circuit in this case is this equivalent circuit, where the word line has activated an NMOS transistor, turning it on for sure. And then we have the PMOS load on the top. And this is the bit line. And there's nothing else active on the bit line by virtue of, of using a uh, row decoder. So what value, what output value do we read on the bit line, so what is V out in this case? Um, this can be obtained by going back to the pseudo NMOS uh, inverter and examining how we obtain the outputs of the pseudo NMOS inverter. And this can simply be done by equating the current in the PMOS transistor, the load transistor, with the current in the NMOS transistor, 
with the correct regions of operation. So the PMOS will be saturated and the NMOS will be ohmic in this case. And you can, you know, carry out a quick check on this. So um, for the PMOS, the current will be KP into minus VDD uh, minus V threshold P. And here I'm assuming uh, that we have um, some form of um, velocity overshoot instead of of velocity saturation. And for the uh, NMOS, it's going to be KN into uh, VDD minus V threshold N into V out minus V out square over 2. And you can solve this quadratic equation for V out to obtain the value of V out, which will be uh, not necessarily zero, but will be close to zero. Now, assume that we are act instead reading the value stored in uh, element in cell 0, 3 which does not contain a transistor, or any of the cells that do not contain a transistor. In other words, we are looking at the contents of bit line 3. So in this case, this would be the equivalent circuit. We have the PMOS, which is always on because its gate is, uh, is grounded, but there's nothing active on the bit line other than the PMOS, because all the NMOSs are turned off. Even the, the cells which actually happen to contain NMOSs on this bit line will be off by virtue of the decoder deactivating their lines. And the current active wo uh, word line does not contain a transistor, and therefore the word line and the bit line are crossing over, and there's nothing on the bit line. So this is the equivalent circuit, which immediately allows us to read V out equals VDD. Now, pseudo NMOS gates in general are uh, unfavorable, and we can see why from, from this treatment, because first, V out for uh, reading zero from the memory is not going to be exactly zero volt. But this is the least of our worries. What actually we care about here is the fact that there is a static steady state current flowing in the equivalent circuit while reading a zero. We cannot allow a situation where there is a steady state current flowing anywhere in the memory. So we should actually redesign the circuit. And this is the uh, actual uh, no ROM that we will be considering for the rest of the module. And in fact, for all other memories, we'll be considering a similar uh, array structure. So here you see that the main difference is that the row of uh, grounded PMOS loads on the top have been replaced with a row of uh, PMOS transistors with a clock signal phi applied to their gates. In effect, what we have done is that we have transformed every column into a dynamic CMOS NOR gate instead of a pseudo NMOS NOR gate. So we have a um, PMOS with a clock signal on top, and then we have a number of NMOS transistors in parallel with their gates con connected to word lines at the bottom. This is the bit, uh, the pull-down network of the dynamic NOR gate. So this is a dynamic CMOS gate. We have uh, extensively covered how to analyze it. Uh, it does not have a uh, an NMOS tail transistor or an NMOS clock transistor but NMOS uh, uh, clock transistors are generally not needed in most practical dynamic CMOS implementations. So how does this uh, network work? So um, essentially, there are three steps to reading. In the first step, the uh, phi signal, the clock signal, is zero. So when the clock signal is zero, all the PMOS transistors on the top are on and active. And we also have to ensure that while uh, the phi signal is zero, all word lines are zero. So even though the uh, decoder always tries to uh, assert one of the, um, one of the uh, word lines, we should ensure that when phi is zero, all the word lines are null. So uh, with phi equal to zero, all the bit line capacitances are going to pre-charge up to VDD. Again, provided that all the word lines are at zero, so everything is going to pre-charge up to VDD. Then we can actually start the reading operation, which proceeds exactly the same way we described reading in the pseudo NMOS NOR, uh, NOR gate. So the word line is raised on the particular uh, row that we want to read from. Again, let's consider word line zero to be on, which means that words, word lines one and two are off. Word line zero is on, so it activates every single cell uh, along the word line. And we are supposed to look at the bit lines and pick the one 
that we want from them. Picking the one is the uh, is the job of the column decoder, which we already said is actually a multiplexer. So when we are reading from a column which, which does not uh, contain a transistor at the particular cell, the equivalent circuit is again just the PMOS transistor and uh, there's nothing at the bottom. So there are no active NMOSs at the bottom. In this case, while reading, the phi signal is equal to one. So even the PMOS transistor is cut off and we have a high impedance VDD that we read at the output. So this high impedance VDD is obtained from the pre-charge phase. On the other hand, if there is a transistor in the cell, then this is the equivalent circuit. There's an NMOS transistor, which is active at the bottom. The capacitor at the bit line, uh, the bit line capacitor, which uh, has been pre-charged to VDD, is allowed to discharge through the NMOS transistor and the value, uh, the output value that we read is equal to zero. Notice that this current that discharges the uh, bit line capacitor is a transient current. Uh, it just discharges the capacitor and in the steady state is going to be equal to zero because the PMOS transistor, while the NMOS transistor is on, is itself off because uh, the phi signal is one. So there's no steady state current in this case. So you see that the bit line, the value on the bit line pre-charges up to VDD during the pre-charge phase and may or may not discharge down to zero during the evaluate phase. In this waveform, we are barely giving enough time for, um, for the bit line to either charge or discharge, but barely giving it enough time is as good as giving it enough time. With memories in general, we're going to always want to take a look at the layout because uh, the layout is the only way that we can have a good understanding of the area or the density of the memory. So uh, just looking at the equivalent circuit is not going to give us a good idea of density. Uh, instead, we should look at the, um, at, the, um, at the layout. So this is the layout of the NOR-ROM. You can see on the top uh, the row of PMOS pre-charged transistors uh, in a well. So this is a, a single well process. Then we have uh, bit lines running vertically and the bit lines are all metal. So we design them using the metal layer. So in module 13, we'll find out that metal layer has a really good advantage, which is uh, high conductivity. This will allow us when we start to uh, uh, make some uh, delay estimates, this will allow us to ignore the resistance of bit lines in general and just consider them lumped capacitors. But uh, the bit lines are gonna be metal and uh, in general, you want long wires to be metal as much as possible. On the other hand, word lines are in the polysilicon layer. And there's a reason for this. If we go back and look at the array, you'll find that the word line always contacts the gates of the NMOS transistors. So it will need to make contact with, uh, CMO with MOSFET gates, which are themselves made using polysilicon. If the word line was made using uh, metal, there will be two issues with this. First of all, we'll need to use a higher metal layer because the bit line is already made using metal. So if uh, using metal ones, so if word lines are made using metal ones, this will create a lot of contacts that we did not need. So first of all, the word line has to be made using a higher metal line. Secondly, this higher metal line will need to go down and make contact with the uh, drains of all the NMOS transistors along the row. So there might be NMOS transistors in each and every uh, column. So there might be two per M transistors that we need to contact repeatedly. Uh, the gates of, the, of these MOSFETs are made of polysilicon. And if the word line is running in a metal two, then that metal two needs to go down and contact the polysilicon, which will need uh, a via and a contact, a via to go down from metal two to metal one and a contact to go down from metal one to uh, polysilicon. And uh, contacts and vias in general have um, a very large area requirement because they have a, uh, a fixed area. They don't have, they don't even have a minimum area. They have a fixed area, but they also have to be enclosed in all directions by both contacted layers. So, 
that word line, this word line would have had to make a contact here and a contact here and then again a contact here in order to go up to metal two. Most of the area would be lost in contacts. There will be a lot of distance between cells, reducing the pitch of the memory and reducing the density of the memory just because we want to run the word line in the metal two layer. So instead, we're going to run it in the polysilicon layer. But the advantage of this is that we don't actually need to make any special effort to contact the gates of the uh, NMOS transistors. The word line is itself the gates of the NMOS transistors. You'll find that all the NMOSes along the word line have a common gate, which is the word line. So what's the price that we pay for doing this? Because it seems like too good to be true. The price that we pay for it is that polysilicon in general has a large uh, resistivity, which um, does not allow us to ignore the resistance of uh, the polysilicon wire while calculating delay. Uh, so word line delay is actually going to be significant when we calculate total delay for the array. So th the next thing is, um, on some in some cells, there are NMOS transistors and some there aren't. So this cell, for example, contains a transistor and this cell does not. In cells that do not contain a transistor, it's really easy. You just run the bit line uh, metal, metal layer uh, and the word line polysilicon layer across each other and they just um, create a crossover and that's it. In cells that contain a transistor you will have to um, have a uh, you have to have a, uh, a diffusion layer below uh, the metal. So what you have here this strange color is just green running and under the blue of metal one. So you have green diffusion running under the blue of metal one. It's making a contact with the metal at this point and it's uh, intersecting with the polysilicon at this in this area. And so this creates a transistor channel here, a, an NMOS transistor channel here, which is contacting the metal at this point. So you can go back to the array and see that it is actually contacting the metal at the drain. And so this point is the drain of the transistor. Now the transistor runs and at the bottom it's also contacting another strip of diffusion or active that is running horizontally. And this strip of diffusion or active running horizontally is actually the ground which is connected to the source of the NMOS. And so this is the source of the NMOS. This piece of, of diffusion is actually the uh, NMOS on the lower word line on word line one. So this is this NMOS, but it's actually flipped over so that its drain is at the bottom and its source is at the top. So the drain is here and the source is on, is on top. Why do we do this? We do this to allow transistors from word line zero and word line one to share the ground. This allows us to run a single ground strip for each two rows of the array. And the reason we want to do this is that the ground strips that run across the arrays are extremely uh, area uh, intensive. They take a lot of area, they consume a lot of area, and they are the main reason that NOR ROMs are known for not being dense. They are not known for being small memories. They are known generally for being fast memories, but if you want a small memory, you're going to go to a NAND ROM instead of a NOR ROM. It's these diffusion strips. If we flip each other row, uh, each uh, other row of, of, of the memory, we will use half the uh, ground strips uh, uh, compared to if we just have a straight implementation. So why is the diffusion uh, layer or the active layer used for the ground? You know, in general, again, long wires uh, are best implemented using metal. And this is particularly true of ground and supply as we saw in standard ASIC, uh, standard cell ASIC design. But this is an exception, again, for the sake of density. Uh, the grounds are gonna be contacted exclusively by NMOS sources, which are in the diffusion layer. And so we are best off implementing the grounds and diffusion to again reduce the need for contacts and vias. And um, I, we can expect to pay a price in, to, in, in resistance because diffusion has really bad resistance, has dismal resistance. But fortunately, grounds 
do not carry signals. So we don't actually worry about delay so much in grounds. We do worry about drops or actually bounces, resistive bounces on ground, but that's another issue. One more practical consideration for NOR ROMs, which will also be uh, important for NAND ROMs, is the fact that uh, NOR ROMs in general uh, are not implemented with a distinction between whether or not there are um, transistors at every cell. Instead, the layout is implemented with um, the assumption that there is a transistor at every cell. So like the layout shown here actually does have a transistor at every cell. There are no um, intersections between uh, word lines and bit lines where there is no diffusion below the metal. Uh, instead, when we'd want to create a cell that does not contain a transistor, we insert one of these little rectangles, and these are known as threshold raising implants. In their simplest form, a threshold raising implant uh, is just going to be uh, doping uh, with P in a P substrate. So it's going to be heavier doping with the uh, body uh, dopant. So this actually increases the body potential of the of the substrate, causing the V threshold of the transistor to rise. So here, there will still be a transistor, but instead, this transistor has a high V threshold. It has such a high V threshold that for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist. If its V threshold exceeds the supply voltage, it's impossible to turn it on, and therefore, it's as good as it doesn't exist. Why is this layout useful? It's just pre more practical because it allows us to reserve programming, to reserve the uh, actual introduction of data into the ROM into a single mask at the end of operation, for example, or at the beginning, it doesn't really matter, but a single mask, which is the uh, threshold raising implant mask.